Welcome to another edition of Forecast Lab. We've got another wound up system there in the Midwest. You can take a closer look at that there on the U.S. Visible Satellite Imagery. Very spectacular. And you can see the dry slot working across Texas, Oklahoma, and into Missouri. Let's take a look at this on infrared. And there it is, our baroclinic weather system across the Great Lakes. We do have some deep convection across Illinois, showers and a few thunderstorms, and that's producing this anvil across parts of Michigan, Lake Michigan, and Indiana. Further north, we get into baroclinic processes, isentropic lift, dynamic lift, upper level forcing, that kind of thing. And that is definitely the case as we get back into the surface system and the upper level system as well. The surface system that appears to be right there over Illinois, that's going to be a surface low. And with these bear clinic systems, they do tend to stack towards the cold air. That would be in a westward or northwestward direction. So we're going to find the upper level troughing in this area right here. Let's take a look at the water vapor imagery. And there we do see the dry slot working into Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois as well. Now we do have clouds in this region, but those are mostly low clouds. The dry air is riding across them in the mid and upper levels. So if you were taking off, say, at the Quad Cities or Springfield, you would probably have some low clouds down near the surface, but above five to 10,000 feet, you'd break out into this terrific clear blue sky. And plenty of clear blue sky across Texas and the Carolinas. Then further south, this looks like a subtropical jet across the Gulf of Mexico area. And there we have more trouble coming in from the west. And that's a look at that. That's a series of Pacific weather systems working into the west coast. And there we have a atmospheric river, a fire hose of moisture coming in from the central Pacific. And yeah, that definitely brings in an increase in clouds, precipitation, and that kind of thing once the bulk of this moisture arrives on the coast. Here's a closer look at it in terms of dynamics. This is going to be the axis of that wave right there. This is an unstable wave coming out of the central Pacific. Most of the heavy lift is going to be right there out ahead of it, but quite a bit of moisture in a large band east and west. Let's refer back to that satellite picture. And that's going to be that wave right there. This is what we call a baroclinic leaf. And you can see the S shape on the back side, indicative of a short wave. So that's how we go about analyzing that. And this is suggestive of a frontal system. Let's take a look at the surface thickness and pressure. And yes, we do have a well-developed surface system. That's going to be at 95 millibar low. The front's running about like that, and it is already occluded, so it's already gone through some development. The triple point located right there, and that is just west of San Francisco. So tracing that over, we've probably got some chance of additional development down there on the tail end. And indeed, it does take some time to get going, but sometime tomorrow, we get that development right there, close to that triple point area. That's going to be about midday, and we get another wave coming together on the tail end of that system. And you can see it's already departed well up to the northeast. Okay, heading into our surface analysis for Friday, there's our surface low near Des Moines. Warm front extending across Illinois towards West Virginia. Cold 50s and rain, easterly winds to the north of that front, and south of there, Temperatures in the 70s with dew points in the lower 60s. The moisture axis, well, we can trace out the 60 degree isodrosotherm. There's 60. And on a tornado day, you could use this to kind of find where the worst of the air mass is. That's the 60 degree isodrosotherm. So the moisture axis is located right there ahead of the front. But not too much development along that front. It is a dry front, and we saw on that water vapor imagery that there's just not much moisture in place. However, the water vapor imagery is sensitive mostly to mid and upper level moisture. There's too much attenuation to pick up the lower levels, so we can use the model data to figure out what's going on. 
Well, we can go to the high resolution rapid refresh and look at the dew point. And this does show the moisture along the front and out ahead of it. There's the moisture axis. Let's take a look at the theta E because that's going to be the, those are going to be the best parcels for development. So in this little suppressed area right here where the values are lower, you can see we just don't have very much instability. Lapse rates are kind of poor. And we do have this little cape robber up there at about 500 millibars. So there is moisture all the way up to 7,000 feet, but we're just missing other ingredients. Let's go a little bit closer to the front where we have the green bands. And there we're getting a little bit of help from heating. Temperature's coming up near 70 degrees, but still the lapse rates are just not all that impressive. You can also see some scouring of the moisture from the mid-levels down to the lower levels. And that's due to that very strong westerly wind bringing plateau air over the air mass and just kind of drying it out near that front. Yeah, and take a look at that photograph there. That's some significant straight line shear. Very high 0 through 6 kilometer bulk shear, and the SRH is not too bad either. Just the fact that you've got that long 0 through 3 kilometer shear, that means once you're sitting off the photograph, you're going to be able to squeeze some helicity out of it. However, trying to get storms going with a highly sheared environment and not much instability, you're going to get a lot of turkey towers and a lot of storms that are trying but just can't do it. When you start curving those hodographs, you don't really need a whole lot to get rotating storms going. But on a straight line day like this, it's not really going to happen. So right now, a lot of forced convection along that front in the Ozarks, but further up north. That's where you start getting closer to that surface low. And the winds here are more backed. So if you go on up there to Iowa and look at the photographs out in this area where the winds are out of the east, we do get that curvature in the photograph. There it is right there. And depending on where exactly you are, there can be localized enhancement for rotating storms. And there is a watch box in that area, Fort Dodge down to Ottumwa, and you can see the reasoning there, risk for a couple of brief tornadoes and small hail. And let us continue on. We can actually see the thermal trough right there in the western Dakotas down towards western Nebraska. We're looking at those red dashed lines. Those are lower thickness values, indicating the average temperature in the lowest five kilometers of the atmosphere is rather low. So the thermal trough located right in there, extending down towards Kansas. And we do actually warm up as we go to the west and we get a thermal ridge right there over California. And that's helping to support that other system off the Pacific coast. In the central U.S., though, freeze watch tonight in the northwestern panhandles for Boise City, Dalhart, Clayton, and extending on up towards eastern Colorado. Denver, Akron, Fort Collins, Pueblo, Trinidad, Lamar, all in that freeze warning. And we do still have a residual high wind warning across parts of western Kansas and central Nebraska. That's for winds up to 60 miles an hour as far as gusts with sustained winds of 40 miles an hour. And then heading out west, there's a weak frontal system off of the coast of California. And that is actually different from that other system we talked about. This is the one we discussed on the satellite imagery. And the one I'm talking about is right there. And it does not even look like it's closed. Looks like an open system, although there is definitely a frontal boundary down there. So very weak support for a low pressure area. So I'm not even sure that that exists. The frontal boundaries, yeah, those are definitely there. Then heading up into the northwestern U.S., that new atmospheric river will crash into the northwestern Pacific region tomorrow morning. IVT values arriving on the west coast, a modest 300 to 500, mostly in Oregon and Washington. And we will see another wave coming onto the coast over the weekend and bring those IVT values up to 1,000 by Monday morning with an occlusion moving up the coast. Then we're going to deal with the remnants of Typhoon Bolovan 
for Tuesday in British Columbia. This area here will be hit pretty hard around midweek. Up there in Alaska, yep, cold as we would expect. Snow coming down in the Brooks Range and the eastern, or I should say western interior region. Warm air flowing northward, producing a little bit of fog in Northwest Territories region. Temperatures in the 40s. And then we go into the high Arctic, and it is quite cold up there. Temperatures as low as 7 degrees at Rhea Point. And there's a well-developed frontal system near Baffin Island. And let's head south into the prairies. Not much going on there. Kind of a warm, high-pressure area and an occlusion off of the Maritimes. All right, let's take a look at the tropical weather. We've got tropical storm Sean way out there. Not looking at much threat from that remaining a tropical disturbance after tonight. And the other one, a little bit more concern in the extended because that will be heading towards the Windward Islands. There's the GFS forecast. There's Sean. There's the other developing wave, and we're not looking for much in the way of impact. Moving very, very slowly. See, this is midweek. They're not even close to Puerto Rico yet. Only by Thursday that happens. And this other wave, some development here, but eventually it does lift up to the north. But, you know, we're 228 hours out. A lot could change between now and then, but the main headline here is nothing to worry about for the next week. In fact, we're going to be dominated by cold air spilling out into the Gulf Stream, Gulf of Mexico, and into the Caribbean. And that will kind of wipe out this part of the Atlantic Basin. Let's take a look at our forecast with the NAM model. This is where we're at right now. Cold front extending down through the mid-Mississippi River Valley into Texas, warm front into the Ohio River Valley, and the occlusion going back towards Iowa. So since these storms are separated from the tropical moisture, they should start shutting down around sunset, maybe just after that. However, this stuff here will keep going since it is supported somewhat by the low-level jet, and that will continue into the wee hours of tonight. So there we go. That's going to be about midnight. Things continue moving to the east. Lots of wraparound into Chicago. And then midday tomorrow. This is going to be for the time of the eclipse. It is going to be pretty good there in Texas and the southern U.S. due to that dry air advection. However, it looks like there's another wave working down from the north. This is very similar to cyclogenesis with those Alberta clippers as they come south. Yeah, that's going to be a little Vortmax coming down through that northwesterly flow and moving into Missouri on Sunday. So remaining unsettled in the central plains. Let's take a look at the cloud cover for that eclipse. And there you go. That's probably as good as of a product we can use. The GFS from Pivotal Weather showing lots of clouds across the northern plains the Midwest and the Great Lakes into the eastern U.S. Best viewing conditions down in Texas. The track of the eclipse running about like this. That's going to be close to where you're going to see the, the ring around the sun. Elsewhere, significant coverage of the sun. You're going to see kind of a crescent sun. And you'll definitely notice a difference as far as the uh, darkness of the sky, the darkness of the surroundings. And it gets a little bit weaker as you go up to the northeast. Not as much to see, although there still will be some darkening. So good luck with tomorrow's viewing conditions. Hope you enjoy it. And we'll have another shot at this in April with the total eclipse. And that's all I have for this edition of Forecast Lab. I do hope that you're enjoying this program. We'll see you back here for the Monday edition for the supporters and on Wednesday for everybody else. Enjoy that eclipse, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.